Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Bob Haas, and with me here, I have Team 19708, the Emerald Bots from Sam Amish, Washington. They've been absolutely fantastic this season, qualifying for the Washington State Championship out of a very tough interleague competition, and recently they were the winning alliance captain at the Washington Tech Invitational. As, as they prepare for the Washington State Championship, we're going to take a deep dive into their robot and custom software and really learn about what makes them so compact and high scoring at the same time. All that and more coming up on First Updates Now. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. Check out our all new FTC content coming to Fund's YouTube in February, including new hosts from the FTC community. We'll have resource guides, top 10 moments, behind the bots interviews, and walkthroughs to help your FTC team improve at youtube.com slash FIRST updates now. I think I've seen you guys recently advertise that you have the smallest drivetrain this season. So walk me through that, what challenges you had in implementing it and how you have made it so compact. Yeah, so for this year, we really wanted to have a small compact robot because our strategy heavily involved putting cones on junctions for circuits, building and ownership. So we started by designing an O-shaped chassis with all the motors inside the channel. So we have two motors directly coupled, coupled to the wheel uh, transversely, and then two motors longitudinally connected and geared to the wheel. Uh, in the center of our O-shaped chassis, we have our four-stage continuously strong lift, and to keep our footprint small, uh, we have our um, motor placed vertically, and we designed a custom gearbox to um, keep our footprint small, and the gearbox required a lot of like alignment yeah, and uh, can we see your guys' drivetrain like from the bottom? I think it'd be a lot easier to like understand all like the different types of uh, transmission methods you guys used. Okay, all right, that that's really cool. And so, was this all done like in some CAD software, or did you guys just have like the free building experience and were able to just prototype and test everything? Yeah, we had we used a bit of CAD to like figure out how to fit everything inside, and then we built it. Uh, once it was done. Cool. And have you guys had any challenges with like tipping or uh, like rigidity or anything like that? Or has it just been like smooth sailing for the drivetrain this season? Yeah, we had a lot of issues with tipping. So we, some of those we fixed with the robot, but we could fix all of them. So a lot of tipping issues are very heavily focused on in software. Yeah, so um, we have a, a number of ways to um, combat the like the um, zero watts tip. So the first thing is by reducing the center of gravity. So as you saw, all of our motors are placed inside of the channels, which um, greatly reduces the center of gravity. And also we um, brought the robot down 12 millimeters, which also reduced the center of gravity. Yeah, and um, so... so you guys mentioned that you have like a lot of software enhancements so let's talk a little bit about your software and what what do you guys do to make sure you don't tip um and how consistent has it been yeah so um we have the, the software measures we took uh, to combat the tip so um we uh, implemented an anti-tip software using the imu's pitch and roll and so if we detected that the pitch and roll was too high, then we'd pause the robot, and then after the pitch and roll values return to normal, then we'd actually continue the movement if and, you were in the middle of the movement. Mm -hmm. And do you guys, like, retract your lift if it's all the way up or anything like that? And have you been using this in matches, or has there not really been a need yet? So, um, we do not actually retract our lift. We keep it in the same position, but um, we, changed, we changed the max speed of the robot depending on the position of the lift, because obviously the higher the lift is, mm -hmm. the more vulnerable the robot is to tip. Um, this um, has maybe happened a few times in the competition, but it's not quite uh, f f affecting us a lot because like I said, it continues the motion after it stops. Sure, and so talking a little bit also about like your path following and like autonomous relating specifically to the drivetrain, I know you guys have a very high scoring autonomous and it's not easy uh, with a robot like that doesn't have too much like horizontal extension. So how do you guys uh, like do your path following, path generation and all of that stuff? Do you use any libraries or is it all custom? 
So um, we do not use any um, external black box libraries such as Roadrunner. Um, so this is all, we, we custom developed um, all of our software. And um, we do use some sensors to help us identify cones um, to make our autonomous more reliable. So we have um, a pair of stereo distance sensors located here. Um, and we use these to identify cones. So what these will do is we use these to um, drive up automatically to a cone and grip the cone. And uh, some advantages of this is obviously our um, in tally off our drivers don't have to um, drive to get the precise position for the cone. And also, um, our, this allowed our gripper to be smaller because when we use when we use these distance sensors to get the precise position for the cone, we don't need such a big gripper. And so, yeah. those distance sensors, if I see correctly, they're like right under the drivetrain, but definitely not like touching the ground or anything, right? Yes. And so the, the, you're able to use this in autonomous as well. Like just you assume like the stack is straight and then you just go to like the right height. I see. And so, you know, you've talked a little bit about your uh, claw. So let's move more into it. It definitely doesn't look like a very like standard claw or anything that we've seen this season. I do see the servo, but it looks like you guys have some like four bar linkages uh, and things like that going on. So walk me through that and how it works. Yeah. So this year we really wanted to have a light gripper so that we could lift up the lift really fast and not be weighed down. So we custom designed a parallelogram linkage based gripper that's custom 3D printed. Uh, so this way it allows a really strong grip and it allows the like, fingers to be parallel all the time. So yeah. that's how we, yeah. And so what was the purpose of deciding to keep the fingers parallel? Like I know some teams, they decide intentionally to not keep the fingers parallel so that it kind of guides the cone always to the center. But with you guys, like there's, it appears that there's nothing necessarily vectoring the cone like towards the inside of the claw. And has that been an issue for you guys or uh, it was actually a feature of the design? Yeah, we wanted to keep our uh, gripper really small and the thing with like vectoring grippers is that it takes a long time to close. Mm -hmm. So we have this so it grips it quickly mm -hmm. and it's also light. And so you say it grips it quickly. So are you running like a super speed servo for that or what? It looks like we go, go build a servo. So like which version? Uh, yes, yeah, it's a, I think it's a speed servo. A speed servo. Okay. And so were the rubber bands that you added to your uh, claw something that you've had like the whole time and it was always planned or was that like you saw a need to add these rubber bands and then you did yeah we have always had them uh and this gripper design is actually used from last year fright fancy oh and wow so we use them to um actually have like friction against the cone and so it won't mm -hmm. just slip out and so yeah that's a really interesting point you brought up that this is a design that you tested and used last season and so have you had any like longevity issues with the design or like have have like the 3d prints broken or is that something you're worried about or has it just been like battle tested for two seasons so you're very confident in its ability in the start of our season this year it did break a few times but we kind of changed the design to make the like thick it was a lot thicker so now it doesn't snap as much mm -hmm. and so kind of transitioning like between your claw and into your lift are there any software automations that you guys use that sort of combine the two uh and what are they in, in what periods of the game do you use them so for example in teleop we have a few automations for example we have uh, a single button that picks up a cone using the distance sensors and um, moves that cone from the substation to the high junction. Mm -hmm. We also have another uh, like function that uh, goes and does what we do in autonomous. For example, it goes from the cone stack and goes to the high junction that is used the most in the autonomous period. Um, we also have a button to uh, use our drive to cone feature, which we can show now. Sure. Oh wow, yeah, and it looks like, yeah, and it looks like the robot like didn't move only uh, like forward and backwards, but also seemed to strafe to uh, the left or right, like whichever direction you're looking at. Was that intentional? And like, is that using that stereo distance sensor um, setup you were talking about before, or talk about that a little bit? So yeah, um, this uh, feature, this drive tactical feature that we just showed, does use this the stereo distance sensors. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, use those distance sensors to automatically drive up to a cone. Um, and we calculate, so yeah, uh, we calculate the errors uh, using the 
distance sensors and we use those arrows to move up to a cone and grip it. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really cool. And so one question I have for you guys is like, uh, with such a tough Washington State Championship coming in, I'm sure you guys really want to be the winning alliance captain or the Inspire Award winner and you know take one of those two spots who will go to the Houston World Championship. So what are your guys' plans to really like elevate your robot to the next level to make sure you have like the consistency and high scores it takes? Like what have you guys changed since the interleague competition and how do you think it'll work out for the Washington State Championship? Uh, so we've made several um, improvements to our robot. Uh, one of the main ones, as you can see, is that we decreased the size of the robot significantly, so it's able to move through the junk, able to move through the junkins very smoothly, and um, we also um, have uh, positioned our motors in such a way so that it overlaps each other, so it's able to fit compactly into our small robot design, and we also um, have um, a coiled wire, uh, which. Um, this coiled wire helps us to um, able to go up and down without our uh, robot it getting attached. We also um, made other improvements, like we also made some other improvements, like our um, like we pulled our uh, gripper inside so that it doesn't um, shake too much when we're dropping the cone. Mm -hmm. All right, Emerald Butts, I think this has been a fantastic deep dive into your robot. I'm sure there's a lot more to go into, but there's definitely a lot to learn, you know, with your stereo distance sensor system and your parallel claw and all the other fantastic features of this compact robot. So thank you very much for doing this Behind the Bot interview, and I really look forward to seeing you guys compete at the Washington State Championship. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Abbas. Thank you. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. Check out our all new FTC content coming to Fund's YouTube in February, including new hosts from the FTC community. We'll have resource guides, top 10 moments, behind the bots interviews, and walkthroughs to help your FTC team improve at youtube.com slash first updates now. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.